want to thank everybody for coming. Good to have you guys here. This class is a continuation of a class that we did last week that we could not finish. And I'm glad we were able to continue on with this with, with it this week because this is a critical topic. This is a topic that is just not talked about for whatever reason, I don't know why, not just in the field of trading, but in the field of psychology and trading psychology. It's not discussed that much. And yet, it could be one of the things that is completely hampering or holding your success from really taking flight, from your ability to develop as a trader. It could be the very one thing that is actually curtailing your growth. It could be the invisible chain. And it may be there working against you and you might not even know it. And that's how critical it is. That it could be working against you not even knowing it. And if that is the case, well, that's what this class and this last class is designed to help bring about, help discuss, and help give methods and techniques so that you can discover and work on this. The bottom line is, is that you are all asking to be traders. You are all not just asking to be traders, you know, in various different forms, part-time. Maybe you like your job. Maybe you like being, you know, whatever it is you're doing. Maybe you like it. My guess is probably many of you don't. Many of you would rather be traders for a living than anything else. And if you're asking to be that, we, you're more than likely asking to be more abundant than you are now. In fact, I would be surprised if any one of you is really saying, yeah, I want to trade and I want to make the same amount of money as I am right now more than likely you're all asking to be more abundant than you are now. And in asking for that, whether you knew it or not, you were ask, actually going on a venture that you had automatically booked tickets for once you made that decision. The thing is, you didn't know where the adventure was going to take you, and you didn't know what, you know, where you were going. But it's an adventure and exploration into your own mind and your own subconscious and unconscious and conditioned habits around money, around success, around wealth, around all these things. Whether you know it or not, these things are affecting you. And based on what most have probably seen in society or heard in society, there's actually a lot of negative talk about money. There is a lot of, oh, money's the root of all evil. I mean, who, who's heard of that one before? Anybody heard that one before? Money's the root of all evil? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Lots of times. Well, guess what? That thought, you hear that, you know, many times, and that's going to plant a subconscious or seed inside you that doesn't exactly inspire you to want to become wealthy. Or if when you do start to become wealthy, that thing will kind of work against you. That's not going to plant a seed of abundance or wealth or anything like that. That's going to plant a negative belief around it. And you've probably heard a bunch of other sayings, and we're going to go over them. But the bottom line is, is that when you're trading, you're really making all your decisions with your mind. And unless you've completely dug out all of the unconscious and subconscious beliefs in your mind, which are generally limiting, and rarely ever has somebody done that, you're going to have things in there that are going to be affecting your overall performance. But the fact that we're trading that the one thing that we're working with constantly is money means that all those things, all those thoughts, subconscious beliefs, things your parents may have said about it, 
your parents' financial health, all those things will have a grave effect upon your, your trading because and your psychology because you are interacting with money. Now, in the last class, we talked about three stories, and this is just a recap. We talked about three stories. We talked about the story of Hamdi, which is called the power of flow, or the story of flow. We talked about the story of the movie Pirate, which is the story about my good friend Philip, and how stealing or taking things, you know, downloading movies or all kinds of things for free when it wasn't gifted to you by the, you know, the creator of that, how that destroys abundance and wealth. And then we talked about the story of the fake money. Then we started to go into the five principles of abundance. And we got through the principle of reciprocity, if you all remember that. That giving is the nature of abundance. That looking for ways to help people, looking to see what you can do for them, instead of thinking what they can do for you. The principle of reciprocity. We talked about what attracts money more than anything else. That's the principle of attraction. And we talked about how money is a multiplier, how like attracts like, and that if you cannot save money, the seeds of greatness are not in you. It takes discipline not to spend. We talked about how saving money and learning not to spend on certain things actually will help build your overall wealth because that money that you're saving begins to attract more and more money, greater and greater and larger amounts of money. And then we got into, and we started to engage in the principle of repulsion. And I'm going to bring us to where we were in the presentation. I'm just going to briefly recap this one, and then we're going to get into a little bit, and then we're going to comment. Let me take, and then we're going to get into some methods and tactics that you can do. But we're definitely going to get into all your comments and questions. So the principle of repulsion literally is about having no money has a disdain effect. If you have no money, you drive away opportunities. And people that are in business probably know this really well. There's probably a lot of things that they had opportunities to do, but because they didn't have the money, they couldn't engage in that opportunity. And that's a lost opportunity. Or maybe there's certain things, the events that you could have gone to that would have been very good for you, but you didn't have the money to go to that event. Or maybe it was a course or an education or whatever. Not having money drives away opportunities. I guarantee you, somebody pulls up to a meeting, a business meeting, where they're trying to solicit business and get business from a particular company or individual or whatever, and they pull up in a car that's kind of damaged, you know, maybe the windshield's been broken for a little bit, I guarantee you that businessman that they're proposing to is going to have second, th second thoughts about it. They're going to be thinking, wait a minute, this person doesn't take care of the car. They don't take care of their things. They don't take care of their possessions. You know, this tells me, this communicates to me that this may be the way they take care of their business. They let it run operated. They let it run damaged. They don't take care of things. You know, they don't even have the money to fix it. If they have the money to fix this, why aren't they fixing their car? Why have they let it be so damaged for us? I guarantee that will happen. And whether you know it or not, you might have had the same subconscious feeling the last time you were driving down the highway and you saw some car that was banged up and it looks like it hasn't been repaired in a long time and that they've just taped it over and, you know, strapped on the bender with like some cables or something like that. And they've been driving like that for months your impression of that person is generally not going to be favorable. You're not going to necessarily think, oh, that's somebody I really want to do business with. This is a natural thing. You want to talk about how money, having no money has a disdain effect. Look at what's happening in America, or look what's happening in Greece. Money's leaving the States. Money is leaving Greece, and money is leaving Europe in large amounts. Why? Because... They don't have money anymore. Americans aren't saving. Companies, just a few corporations, you know, handfuls of corporations are hoarding all the cash. 
and the wealthier are getting wealthier and the poor and the middle class are getting wiped out. So money's going into a concentrated few, but overall money is there's a lot less of it in the states. And money's leaving. You know, there's not like there's massive foreign investment into the states. It's not like people are scooping up houses. Houses are cheaper than ever now. Longest time they've been this cheap. It's been so long that they've been this cheap. And yet foreign investors are not coming in and scooping these things up. Home sales have been decreasing time and time again. And so you would think, wow, there's such good opportunities here. It's so cheap. People would just naturally be buying, but they're not. Not having money has a disdain effect. Now, you take the other end of the spectrum, which is Asia. And Asia as a whole is generally a culture of savers. They actually have a very different mentality around money as a whole, much more disciplined approach. In the States, we have what is called negative spending. That means, and it's somewhere, you know, several percent down. What it translates into, somebody making $100,000 a year is spending between one hundred and five and 120000 Financially, we all can in, intuitively realize that's obviously a disaster, especially if it continues. Well, it's been going on for years. Our savings rate has been continually dropping. Contrast that to traditional Asian cultures, they're much more conservative about their finances. We tend to, we tend to, or the Asians tend to, I said we, I'm not Asian, but Asians tend to say, hey, if I'm making $100,000, they actually look and say, you know, I'm really making 90000 They take 10%, they shave it off, put that away in savings, and that's for if situations ever get really bad or to invest in other things. So they're much more frugal about things like that. And where is all the money going to right now? All the money is going to Asia. By 2025, eight out of the top ten countries by trade will all be in Asia. U.S. will go from first to fifth. Germany will go from, was it like fourth to seventh? Number one will be China. Eight out of ten will be in Asia. All the money is going to Asia because that's where the money is right now. Having no money has a disdain effect. It repels money away. It's the law or it's the principle of repulsion. So if you don't have money, that means you're living below, you're living above your means and you have to learn to live below your means, not above them. You wouldn't believe how many multimillionaires, some of them decamillionaires, do not even come close to spending what they could be. They don't even live up to their means. I know a lot of them that drive simple four doors. They don't buy one hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollar cars. Most of them live well below their means. One great millionaire said this one thing: "Yeah, I was going to buy a one point five million dollar house. We decided to buy a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar house. Why? Because buying the one point five million dollar house is not going to make us twice as happy." I met a guy who manages a billion dollar portfolio. He pulled up in a Chevy Aveo. That's not an expensive car. And when I talk to him about it, he's just like, why do I need a Mercedes? I'm just going from here to there and this and that. The guy spends well below his means. He understands the value of wealth. He truly is conscious about it. And that was something that these, these mentalities that they had, not just when they had wealth, but when they didn't. It's easy to say, oh, well, when I have money, yeah, I'll spend a lot less. It's easy to do that. But that's not how you get from here to there. You have to have the mentality of abundance and follow all these principles, whether you have money or not. It has nothing to do with it has nothing to do with your outer circumstances. Having the mindset of abundance and the mentality of abundance has nothing to do with what you have and what you don't have. It is not dependent upon outer conditions. It is an inner state of reality. And if you really want to build abundance, you have to start with that now wherever you're at, whether you have money or not, whether you have some abundance, a little abundance, a lot of abundance, or no abundance. You have to start with it wherever you're at. It's easy to put it off in the future and say, I will be disciplined as a trader when I'm successful 
or I will be disciplined in my finances when I have a lot of money to pay my bills. How do you think you get from here to there? It's Imagine a professional sports player saying that. You know, I will practice hard when I'm, you know, a Golden Glove winner or an NBA champion or professional golfer. It doesn't work that way. You have to practice hard to get to there. The problem with, <clears throat> you know, the one thing I like about sports is that because it's so physical, there's this, like, clear physical result. You can see yourself getting stronger. You can see yourself doing more. You can, you know, hit the ball farther. You can shoot the arrows better. You can – there's a real physical reality that's easy for us to communicate with and communicate and communicates back to us. But when we're trading, the problem is, is that it's not a team sport. There's not other players trying to pick you up. There's not other people on the team saying, hey – you got to get your act together. You're not practicing or following your discipline or anything like that. It's just you. It is just you. Maybe you have a mentor, and if you do, that's great. Maybe you have an educator. If you do, that's great. They will be able to help you a lot along the way, but they won't do all the work for you. You have to do the work. You have to build these, work on these principles and the mindset of abundance and be disciplined. And if you're not, the only person you get to blame, the only common denominator in all this is you. You're the common denominator in all of all of the results that happen in your life. Nobody else. So getting back to the principle of repulsion, it really is complementary complementary to the like attracts like learning to save money. It's really the inverse of that. Not you don't have any you're going to push away opportunities. I guarantee I would not have been able to be in the opportunities or work with the opportunities or talk to the people or do business with the people that I do if I had no money, if I wasn't successful as a trader. And I didn't get to become a successful trader and then start building these mindsets. I started where I was at and built it and learned these techniques and practiced them every single day from here to there, from the beginning till this day. The moment I started studying this, there hasn't been a day gone by that I haven't been practicing these techniques. Absolutely critical. Okay, now I want to show you a series of four pictures. And I want you to take a look at them. And I want you to tell me what are some common variables you see amongst these four pictures. There's a subtle delay, so I'm going to take my time with each one but I want to take a look at this we only got two more principles to go and then we're going to take some questions so here's picture number one these are all pictures that I you know decide to to take not of my house this isn't my house I'm these are all interior design photos here's the third one really take a good look at them and then here's the fourth one now, looking at all four of those pictures, what is the one common denominator amongst all of them? This has all the pictures. These are all pictures of, in, you know, interiors at different magazines. And, it could have, and that's why maybe they're not. <laughs> Care of the class. Coffee house. Nice. That is pretty funny. Space lighting elegance. Upskeeple of carrying things. People who value things care for them. And when you care for things, they have more energy. Case in point, your body. If you care for your body, you exercise, you give it good food, you give it the right things, you're going to have a much better body. You're going to have a much more stronger, healthier body. If you care for your pet, you give them the right food, you give them the right things, you exercise them, you give them the things that they need, they're going to have more energy. You care for your house they are going to have more energy. Have, have you ever seen an interior design magazine or an architectural digest magazine where the interior is completely trashed? Have you ever seen that before? Never. Never. And you never will. You never will because all of what they're representing is not just abundance. But they are representing the energy of caring for things. 
talk about, let's say, messy cars or let's say bathrooms or houses. Have you ever gotten a really messy car before? Did that actually give you a really strong impression of the person that you were, was driving you around? Probably not. Imagine you're, let's say, in a business meeting with somebody, and they decide to take you to a site or something like that to look at something, and you get in their car and it's trashed. Does that give you a favorable impression of that person, someone you're really excited to do business with? No. But if you get in their car and it's well taken care of and it's clean and it's pristine, everything's in its right place, you think to yourself, wow, this person really takes care of things. There's a greater chance that this person takes care of their business the same way or these other things the same way. That translates over. It's a natural intelligence that we all respond to. Same thing when you go into a house. You ever gone into a messy house before? Does that really make you feel invited? Does that really make you feel like you want to come back? Not at all. I had one roommate in college way back in the day. They had, I swear, the messiest room on the planet. And to me, it was no irony that they had the least amount of guests and visitors in their room. Nobody wanted to go in there. Some people couldn't even step on the floor without stepping on something. You're not going to attract abundance and high-level players and high-level situations if you don't care for things around you, if you don't even care for your own things, if you don't care for your house or your office or your bedroom or your kitchen or any of those things. Why, why, should, you, why should you become more bu abundant or wealthy? Why should you receive more? You can't even care for the things that you have. Only when you really are caring for things that you really are saying, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for more. I'm open to more because I will care for whatever is given to me, no matter how little or how much, I will care for it. That will naturally create a situation where you will attract more energy to you. I guarantee somebody comes into my office or my house and they are generally impressed. They always say the same thing. Wow, it feels great in here. Wow, this is really clean. Wow, this is you know a great place. This is a great office. Wow, this feels really nice in here. Yeah, because I take care of it. I put a lot of energy into taking care of it. And when people come here, they naturally want to come back. They naturally want to come to my office to do business or hang out or talk about things. Or they want to come to my place. That is building abundance. Have you ever been into a met somebody's bathroom that was just completely trashed? doesn't make me excited to go to the bathroom doesn't make me want to come back or give them energy. Principle number four is the principle of caring for things. Ask yourself, what things in your life are you caring for or not caring for? You know, do you really care for your house? Do you really care for your spaces in your bedroom or your office? Because if you're not, you're not, you're sitting in an environment, especially your office. You're sitting in an environment where you're working, you're trading, and you're marinating in that energy all day. You have to learn how to care for things. Learn to spend time maintaining the spaces you live and especially work in or drive in. Again, by caring for those things, you are communicating to the universe. You will be a steward for things, and this in return brings things back to you. This is the underlying principles of feng shui, which is the Chinese form of of Chinese form of relating to spaces and energy. And Vastu is the Indian or Ayurvedic form. I've been trained in both and I've been practicing both for 10 years now. I actually, when I was buying my house, I actually turned down several places because they didn't have good feng shui to begin with or good Vastu. I even consulted my teacher of that. I spent a lot of money consulting with him saying, hey, you know what, here's the layout. I even sent him pictures of like where it is on Google Earth and this and this and that. We analyzed everything because I have direct experience of what it is like to not care for things. And I have a direct experience of what it is to care for things. And as soon as I started doing that, I started naturally attracting more abundance. So ask yourself, and take a look at things in your life. What things am I caring for? What things am I not caring for? Particularly start looking at the things you are not caring for. In your house, bathroom, cars, 
office, anything, maybe even your body or your mind. By caring for things, you, they will naturally have more energy. And who's that going to feed? It's going to feed you in your trading. That's what you'll be marinating in all day. Can't express this enough. The last principle is the principle of intention and willingness. <clears throat> and this, this one is the one that really has to do with something that's very famous out there called the secret. And we're going to actually get into it, and I'm going to tell you why. <coughs> I'm going to tell you where. I'm going to tell you why I think the secret actually isn't that useful. Kessa says, "I've met I've met very messy Chinese. They have never heard of feng shui." Sure, there's always going to be people like that. Just because just because feng shui was created in China doesn't mean all the Chinese are practicing it. <laughs> That's like saying everybody in China is going to be a kung fu master. <laughs> It's pretty silly. But anyways, I'm saving the end for com comments here. So let's get into the principle of intention and willingness. Having a positive mindset about success and money and abundance is absolutely critical. It is absolutely critical. In some sense, I think the secret was a good thing because it kind of started to awaken people up about that. <clears throat> but at the same time, I think it really falls short. And I will get into some examples of that. But you have to at least have a positive mindset about success, money, wealth, and abundance. If you don't, there's no way you'll ever be successful at trading because you'll always be subconsciously throwing the great aid out there which blows up your situation or totally underpins and pulls out all the structure of what you built. It destroys the building before you've completed it. That will often manifest in having a lot of successful trades, building a lot, you know, a really big account, and then doing something really silly, and one trade blows up your entire account. Maybe that sounds familiar. That just doesn't have to do with discipline. That also has to do with your mindset about abundance. And I even wrote a great article on that called Your Equity Threshold. What is your equity threshold? You can read that later. But the mindset is critical. Mindset is like having the compass of your mind thinking positive about money instead of the negative. It means saying things, having the language of success, money, and wealth in the positive and not in the negative. It means orienting your entire mind towards being more successful. It means thinking big. Not dreaming big, thinking big and taking massive action toward that. There's no point in thinking small. There is never any point in thinking small. History is not filled with people who thought small. The people that we know of in history are people who thought big. There's a great quote from Michelangelo around this where he says, the danger in life is not having a goal too high and not reaching it. The danger in life is in having a goal too low and reaching it. That's the danger in life. Think big. Think of something that's going to challenge you to your core. Think of something that's going to force you to expand, to go beyond your limiting habits and beliefs. Otherwise, you're just going to be the same as you always have been. If you don't stretch yourself, if you don't expand your abilities, you're just going to be expressing the same patterns in history over and over again. Now, in getting into specifics about intention and willingness, or intention and the mindset, avoid at all costs speaking in the negative about money. Maybe you've heard these things before. Maybe you've said something like this before. And I'm going to go over a list of things. One of them, I'm broke. Anybody ever said that before? You ever said that before, I'm broke? That's speaking about finance, wealth, money in the negative. Or, I don't have the money. I can't tell you how many times I've heard somebody say, I don't have money. And I'm like, wait a minute, I know you have money in your bank account. That's not true. What you really mean is you don't have the money to pay for that. That is very different than saying, I don't have money. 
your language actually programs your mind to think in a certain way. It's a feedback loop. Or another one is, I can't afford that. Or using if instead of when statements. These are all more negative. They're not more positive. Has anybody ever said something or heard the saying, money isn't everything? Has anybody ever heard that saying? Yeah? Yeah? Usually the person who's saying money isn't everything is the one who likely doesn't have much and uses it as an excuse for why they don't have it. Oh, well, money's not everything, you know, so I'm okay with not having money. That's really just an excuse to feel comfortable about their situation. Money is the root of all evil. We talked about that. Money isn't the root of all evil, and it's not even the love of money that's the root of all evil. Money certainly isn't evil when you need to pay your rent, is it? Or when you need to buy groceries, is it? Or you need to pay your bills not evil then why is it all of a sudden evil money's not the root of all evil that's ridiculous but yet that statement's been out there for so long that doesn't help the way you build abundance if you think about money in such a negative way do you really think i'm going to attract a really good female partner in a relationship if i'm constantly talking about women and how shitty they are and you know they're crazy and this and you know they're not worth being with and you know they cost a lot of money do you think I'm really going to have a great partner if that's the way I'm constantly talking about women? Or do you think I'm going to have a great job if I'm constantly talking about that? Obviously not. Same with money. A couple other things. Well, actually, those are. I think that's good in terms of the statements. But to sum it all up, all of these statements likely have affected your subconscious or your unconscious thinking around money, wealth, success. And they've probably affected you in some way to maybe feel guilty about having money or feel guilty about being successful or any of those things. All of those negative statements do not help orient your mind towards being abundant or having the mindset of abundance. Turn the, instead of saying these things or really thinking about really thinking about money in the negative, start to think about it in the positive. See how you can turn these thoughts on their head and use language which doesn't repel money or abundance. Instead of saying, I don't have the money, it's far better to say, I'm not interested in spending money on that. One's negative, one's more neutralized. Doesn't create a negative belief or thought or energy about it. Instead of saying, I don't have money, you can say, I have money, but I'd rather use it for something else. Completely different. Completely different. Or start thinking in the positive towards money. Instead of thinking, wow, I always seem to re repel situations or repel you know, money or abundance, or every time I get it, I seem to lose it. Well, that's not going to help your reality. You have to start thinking positively about it. I do appreciate the secret in the sense that it really pointed out having a positive intention and having a positive thoughts about you know money and abundance. It definitely helps. I think it's great, but I think it goes far short. And I will talk about that in a second. The mindset of abundance comes from thoughts. It comes from your language. It comes from your recognition of abundance. It comes from you respecting abundance, acting with abundance and in accordance with abundance. That mindset con and is completely separate from what you have and do not have. It's completely separate. So try and spend some time. I definitely recommend spending some time thinking about how is it your mindset and intentions and thoughts and language and actions have been either in accordance with abundance or not in abundance. Okay, second part of the principle of intention is willingness. I also wrote a really good article on this one as well, which actually gives you some key things that you can talk about or explore and work on some key exercises to build the willingness. This is where the secret falls short. And let me talk about why. Intention is complete, positive intention and positive thinking is completely necessary, but it's not sufficient. 
it is not sufficient unless you produce massive action to go from here to there. If positive intention and thinking was all it took to become successful, or if just positive intention and thinking, period, was all it took to achieve something, I can guarantee you this world will be a different place. Case in point on how positive intention and thinking doesn't translate into reality. It helps. It helps put you in the right direction. It orients your mind in the right direction. And it may start you acting differently, but you have to follow it up with massive action. Case in point on how intention and just the, just the thinking of, oh, I'm going to attract this and then it's going to come to me and pretty soon there's going to be a Mercedes in my you know driveway and I'm going to have this great house and everything like that. Here's a case in point on how intention, just having the intention, a really strong intention, doesn't necessarily or will not be enough to create your reality. I was thinking about this a lot and I was trying to think of a good example and I think I came up with one. How many times has a man walked into a bar thinking to himself, I'm going to meet some really fantastic, good-looking girl and take her home? How many times has a man thought that and completely failed and not happened? Over 50%? 60%? 70%? Probably a lot. It didn't matter that they had the intention. They more than I can't tell you how many times men went into bars thinking like this. Not just because I was that person many times, but I know guys. I've spent a lot of time with guys going to bars. I can't tell you how many times I heard them think that, say that, talk about it, everything. And yet it never happened. The intention by itself was meaningless without action. If they never went and talked to a woman, if they never went and started socializing, connecting with them, doing anything to even make that a possibility, chances of that happening in reality are very slim. Intention and positive thinking is necessary, but it's not sufficient to make it a reality. To make it a reality, you have to be willing to do more than 9 out of 10 people out of there, 99% of the people out there. What you don't realize is that in trading, or in whatever it is, in trading though, we're talking about trading, we're talking about money, we're talking about abundance, your weakest skill in your field in trading is what sets the height for your income. So is it your risk management? Is it your psychology? Is it your diligence? Is it your discipline? What is it? Whatever that weakest skill is, that's what's going to set the height of your income. Not your system. Not, you know, your ability to push buttons. But whatever is your weakest skill. And if you don't have the willingness to work on that, then you will constantly find yourself repeating the same process over and over again in trading, in relationships, in all those things in your entire life. It's the same with me in archery, the weakest things in my aspect of archery, what sets my overall consistency in my shot, or lack thereof. That's why I'm constantly working on my weaknesses, not my strengths. So having the right intention to be a successful archer is not enough. I have to be willing to work harder than most people out there I have to be willing to break through my obstacles and work on my weakest parts in my particular field. Whatever that is, whatever that is in your trading, find it and go directly for it. Turn yourself into a laser beam and just focus directly on that. I guarantee you start focusing on it, you start putting the energy towards it, you start being willing to work on it, and you will see change in your trading. It's, it, you can apply this to anything. You can apply it to sports. You can apply it to shooting pool or archery or golf. Whatever it is, apply that principle. But you have to be willing. You can't just have the intention. You have to be willing. Absolutely critical. The problem is, 
especially in trading, and this is why it's such an unpopular subject, risk management, discipline, psychology, diligence, following your trading plan, these are the things that are least talked about and yet are probably the most important. Why? Because it's a skill you're not good at yet. You're not excited about it because you're not good at it yet. A lot of things are not that exciting when you're not good at them. Once you become good at them, it becomes a hell of a lot more fun. Have you ever played pool? You know, at one point in playing pool, I wasn't that good. And guess what? It wasn't that fun. Once I started to get a heck of a lot better and could actually start to do things with my shots, pool becomes a lot more interesting. It's the same thing with archery. It's the same thing with golf. It's the same thing with trading. The only reason why risk management doesn't seem exciting to you is because you're not that good at it. Once you realize how useful and important it is, you will never, ever want to disobey your risk management rules again. Once you realize how important discipline is, or being diligent is, you'll never not want to be disciplined again. In the last 10 years, I can count the number of days on my hand that I have not practiced yoga or meditation. Why? Because not only have I gotten pretty solid at these things, but I realize what it's like to be without them. I realize what it is like to have a day without doing my yoga or to have a day without meditating. My days are completely different with or without them. And that's why I can count on one hand the amount of days that I've missed in the last, actually, 11 years now. You have to be willing to work at these things, particularly the things that you're most challenged with. I want to talk about one last story about willingness, and then I want to talk about my final thoughts, and then we'll answer some questions. I was at a bar about a year and a half ago with somebody. And I was talking about, like, what it is to, you know, I was talking about where I live and we were talking about where they live and, you know, the differences in cost of living and things like that. And, you know, I was just asking questions. I was actually thinking about getting a place, you know, in their city. And, you know, we started talking about money. And I I like talking about abundance. I like talking about you know, helping people become abundant or the principles of abundance. But I generally just don't like to talk about my money too much. I'm very private about things like that, you know, and because 95 or 99% of people I know or meet on an everyday basis, I have more money, sometimes that makes them feel uncomfortable. And I just, you know, I I don't like to brag about any of those things I have. I'm very lucky. I feel very grateful for what I have. It could be gone in a second. Who knows? It could be gone today, tomorrow, in five minutes. You know, I'm grateful for what I have and how I have it and how long I've had it and how it's, for the last 10 years, my abundance has grown. But I generally don't like to talk about specifics. And with this person, though, we started to kind of get into specifics. And I just gave them a roundabout rough answer. And when I told them, they their face lit up and they started to smile. And they said something very interesting to me. They said wow, you must have good luck. And I looked at them for a second, and I and I thought, I'm like, wow, this person really doesn't understand me at all. What they just said totally compromises me. Why is this so interesting? Why was this such an interesting story to me? Because when people who are not successful often hear about people who are successful, they think it's luck. They think it's something that unique that they have and that they don't have. And they think, oh, well, I don't have it, so that, you know, I can't, I can't be successful. You know what? I can't attribute my success to luck. My success was built by hard work. I worked my ass off every single day to become good at trading. I worked my ass off, spent hours and hours a day. I can't tell you how many times I was sitting in my office and everybody outside, while it's midsummer, is playing with their friends and family and sitting by the pool. And here I am studying charts on a Saturday, looking at patterns, going through data, working with my programmer, meeting with people, flying across the country, sitting in 10-hour meetings about investments. Anytime somebody meets somebody that's successful who's not successful themselves, they want to think it's something that 
unique that that other person has that they don't have. Oh, they're a genius. Oh, they're brilliant. Oh, unique at this. Guess what? Anybody who's been successful at what they did, they had to get there through hard work. Don't undermine my work that I've done and don't compromise me or don't compromise anybody who is successful. People who are successful, work hard at it. I'm not, not going to attribute, how could I have been lucky over 10 years? You know how many different trading decisions I've made over the last 10 years? Luck doesn't follow you around that much. It doesn't follow you through thousands and thousands of trades. But, but being, being disciplined, being diligent, following my trading plan, using proper risk management, studying markets, learning patterns, building pattern recognition, oh yeah, spending what, 10, 20, 30 hours a week in a brain gym, training my mind to actually build my neurobiological connections to be stronger so I can recognize patterns better, have better memory, better attention, better processing skills. Do you really think that's about luck? It has nothing to do with luck. I'm not scoring top 5% in a brain gym that has over 5 million people in it. Yeah, I'm scoring in the top 5% of all the people. I'm not doing that because I'm just some naturally smart person. I worked hard to get to there. I worked. I trained my mind every single day to actually build biologically stronger neurological connections, to build a better central nervous system physiologically, to train my mind in different things because I know if I train my mind in memory, in you know attention, in problem solving skills, in pattern recognition, that's going to translate into trading. My success wasn't due to luck. It was all due to hard work. Nobody I know who is successful, not one person who I know is successful, didn't get there without massive focus and immense effort. That is why the secret falls short. You can't just have the thought about it. You have to have massive focus and immense effort behind it. Now, I want to spend a few minutes going over. There's a lot of comments here. I want to spend some time answering these comments because you guys asked some great questions. But just to confirm, Maud, there is no more. Okay, great. There's nothing after me. So I have time to go over these questions. Okay. Donna says, Chris, have you seen The Secret, the movie? I saw it for about five minutes and I turned it off because I realized how ridiculous it was. So, yes. Yeah, I had already realized, yeah, you have to have positive mindset, positive intention. But I also realized how limited the secret is. It is so limited. It's, it just doesn't cut it. So, yes, I have seen it. Next one. Love of money. I don't even think necessarily it's the love of money. I love money. And nobody ever accuses me of being evil. I love money, but I'm not attached to it, though. I would say I enjoy it. I enjoy it really well. I love it, but I also care for it. I respect it. I respect the, I respect the wealth. And the abundance that I have. And I try and care for, I try and, I follow all these principles of abundance and I work on them every single day. Am I perfect in them? No. And that's why I keep working on them. I will work on these probably till the rest of my life. And so, you can love something and it not be evil. I don't think loving money is evil. I think money by itself is neutral. Therefore, loving money can't be evil. I would say, I would say any ignorance around money can lead to evil actions. That's what I would have to say around it. So, let's see here. Next one. Dry Desert says, could also be you're unconsciously sabotaging yourself when you try to achieve something you think you don't deserve. Exactly. I, I couldn't agree with that more, Dry Desert. You know, there's a lot of your unconscious and limiting beliefs will be constantly pulling the rug from out under you. And you won't even know it. They could actually be the Wizard of Oz that's causing you to be dis undisciplined or to be to make improper decisions or whatever. In fact, to be honest, 
Well, actually, let me let me share with you a great story. Maybe you read my article. Maybe you didn't. I hope you did. But the article I wrote about your equity threshold, I'm going to tell you the brief story about the guy in there. His name, we're going to call him James. He was a trader when I was working for the broker, and he had this great track record. He could take $3,000, turn it into $10,000, and anywhere from one to three months consistently. Do it again and again and again. Been doing it for years. Well, after checking out his track record, the broker got the bright idea. Let's give him some money. Let's have him trade for us. We gave him $100,000. Guess what he did? He destroyed all of it. Well, not all of it. We, we cut the plug after a certain point. Why? Because his mind had a certain equity threshold. There was a certain amount of money that he was used to relating to. For him, taking 3000 and building it to 10000 wasn't that much money. He was really working with $7,000. He was working with under $10,000. And when he started his account at 3000 his maximum risk was $500. $500 in his life wasn't that big a deal. Because he had an income, he had a job, he had all these things. So losing $500 on a trade wasn't that big a deal. He had a threshold of equity that he was used to relating to. And so when he was within those boundaries, none of his psychological hot buttons were getting pushed that caused him to make bad decisions or freak out or get emotional. Fast forward him to when he's trading a $100,000 account, now his risk is $3,000 a trade. So when he got $1,000 down, that was twice as much as he would ever have been used to dealing with before. And then when it started to get even more, $1,500 or $2,000 down, he's thinking, holy shit, I have never lost $2,000. This is a lot of money. To him, it was a lot of money. He hadn't built up his thermometer or his mindset to deal with larger amounts of money. He passed his equity threshold. And so here it was. There was this unconscious thing that was sabotaging him to make bad decisions. He was still trying to trade the trades in the same system he was before, but all of a sudden he just went off the tracks. He went off the reservation. Why? Because he had gone beyond his equity threshold. He was going beyond something that all of a sudden his emotional and psychological and unconscious hot buttons all got pushed. And that happens with money and trading all the time. It may be that you've hit your equity threshold. It may be that you haven't, but there's something else going on. It could be a lot of things. That's something only you can find out. But absolutely true, Dry Desert. Very good point. Todd says, in trading, making pips is my goal, not money. I think that's a fantastic way to look at it. I That's the method that I always recommend because I know people have hot buttons around money. You know, it just... At a certain point, you raise the money to a certain level, their hot buttons are going to get hit. Maybe your buttons don't get hit when you're playing poker with 30 cent, you know, blind. But I guarantee if I raise the blinds continually up to a certain point, eventually your hot buttons are going to get pushed. Maybe it's at $50 blinds. Maybe it's at $200 blinds. Maybe it's at $10,000 blinds. I guarantee if I raise the blinds enough in poker, your buttons around money are going to get pushed. And your decision making will change. So absolutely, absolutely. That's why I have people focus on making pips and not money because when they're focused on making pips, they tend to be making good decisions. But even then, I tell them, try not to focus on making pips. Just make good trades. The pips will come and the money will come. So great idea, Todd. Philip, says, Philip J. says, is that probably because they are content with having enough rather than seeking an abundance of stuff? You know, I can't really say that, but what I can say, I think you're referring to caring for things. But, you know, these people were like this when they didn't have money. You know, it's not like they were living above their means when they didn't have money. They just, you know, I, and the, this guy I know his name's Jason, manages about a billion dollars. You know, it, it, it's, it's in all kinds of different instruments. He's not just managing one issue. You know, he's got insurance products and pension products and all these things. He's got a massive, you know, portfolio. But he's always been like that. He's always, you know, he was always dressed very simple. I always felt like I was overdressed when I was meeting him. And it had nothing to do with being content to having enough. He was like that from the beginning. He just understood the value of things and he cared for things. 
and he didn't feel the necessity for certain things that weren't going to make him any happier. That's why he was that way. Dread it says, if you have a little money, it's pretty likely you're, you try to cling to the little you have. That is fear, and that is very counterproductive. You can't comfortably make investments if you're in fear. You can't eat tomorrow, blah, blah, it's reactive. Yeah, again, you know, and, and the point I want to, you know, make about this is that these principles of abundance have nothing to do with what you have or don't have. They get reinforced if you go from less to more. But the bottom line is, is that the mindset of abundance is not dependent upon outer circumstances or outer things or wealth or anything like that. It is an inner state of being. It is not reflective of what you have and what you don't have. So whether you have it or not, whether you have little money or no money, have to you, you you're going to want to learn the training these things they will all increase the chance that you'll become more abundant in your life it's the path forward you can't say oh i'm going to exercise or i'm going to get a better diet when i'm slim that doesn't work you have to exercise and eat less than more than more than the you have to eat less calories than what you're actually consuming or you have to actually burn more than you actually eat So it's the same thing with this mindset. Whether you're there or not, there is no other place to start than where you are now. You have to start with where you're at. Okay, so let's see. Jano says, so why this people making wealth for what reason? I'm not sure I totally understand the question, but if you're asking why are people making wealth and for what reason? Because it creates more opportunities. It allows you to do more things. It allows you to actually focus on being creative instead of trying to tread water. If you're just barely trying to pay your bills, you're spending a lot of your energy just trying to tread water. And you have very little time to unleash your inner creative talent, whether it be trading or art or designing houses or whatever. But once you get past that, once you get past that paying bills and treading water thing, then you can start to swim. I think people, you know, I can't speak for why people are making wealth, but I think abundance is a natural expression. I think it's a natural expression. I think all these principles are actually the natural state we're all trying to get to. I think there's natural state we're all trying to express. Now, unfortunately, we have recent history that wasn't that abundant. My parents grew up in the Great Depression. Their thoughts and mindset about abundance didn't help me. It actually created very negative beliefs and thoughts about money and abundance. And I had to first become aware of it and then deprogram that and then create a whole new set of programming to replace all that and go figure once I started applying and working on the principle of abundance, that's when my abundance and wealth started to increase. And it has been now for the last 11 years. Every single year it's increased. Not one year has it gone down. And every single year I work more and more intensely at these things. But none of this actually started to change until I started to work on this. I can't speak for others, though. I can only speak for myself, Jana. That says media plays a lot of peer pressure in the Western economies also. Yes, they do. Marketing and advertising in the States is that, in the Western, you know, economies is actually very prolific. It's, it's pretty unbelievable. I've been out of the States for a long time, but every time I go back, I get to see how powerful the advertising and marketing engine is and, you know, how it takes a lot of inner strength to not be caught up in that. Although I've been out of that, you know, for a long time, not just out of the States, but I kind of figured out the whole marketing and, you know, the advertising thing a long time ago and what the whole message of the U.S. is, though, and Western economies is, so. It really depends on the person. Uh, Ozzy USD says, so Chris, tell us about how you have changed when you hit your bad streak during your earlier years to how successful you are now. What changed in terms of attitude? Well, it's really too, that question is more directed about my trading process. So I want to stay focused on the topic. What I will say is that 
once I committed to working on being abundant, no matter how much I had, working on these five principles, I never stopped, no matter whether I had a good streak financially or a bad streak. I never stopped. Because I realized it had nothing to do with how much I have, and that if I want to get from here to there, I have to work on it, not just when it's convenient and good, but also when it's challenging. I knew that. I knew that from experience. I knew that from playing sports. I knew that from life. I knew it from yoga. I knew it from meditation. I knew it from all kinds of experiences. I had so much context with that experience that I said to myself, you know what? I'm committed to being abundant. I'm committed to being wealthy. I'm committed to being a successful trader. And I knew if I want to be a successful trader, I'm asking to be more abundant. Therefore, I have to have and build the mindset of abundance. So I literally, hey, here's here. Here's where I want to get to. I'm going to need to take massive action. I had to be willing to do the massive action effort to get from here and there. And that meant constantly, day in, day out. Anytime I was faced with the situation, does this build abundance? Does this hurt abundance? I was constantly thinking about that almost with every decision I was being faced with. So I'll answer that question, you know, so I'm answering that question in terms of this lesson. You know, if you want to know more about that in terms of trading, that's a separate question. But in terms of the law, the, will, the principles of abundance, I never stopped working on them. So hopefully answers your question. Okay. More questions, and then I want to talk about final thoughts. Uh, Fintan says, what's the other principle you study, Chris, apart from feng shui? It's called Vastu. It's the Ayurvedic form of, you know, you can translate it into feng shui. It's the Ayurvedic form of caring for the energy of spaces. And I actually, from four and a half, almost five years ago, anytime I was moving into a new space, I was always checking to make sure that they followed all the principles of feng shui and vastu. In fact, when I got this flat hair in Argentina, I actually looked at a total of 63 different flats before I finally decided on this one because I couldn't find one that had all the qualities that I was looking for. And when I walked in this place, I knew it instantly. I just, ah, this is it. It has it all. And go figure, you know, I spent a lot of time not only caring for the place that I'm going to be living in, but caring for the place that I'm, as I'm there. And go figure, my abundance has increased every single year. I'm getting the final curtain call. Let me ask a few questions. Jeno says, so Chris, can corrupted politicians make an excuse that his following laws of abundance or have a positive new view on money? I can't speak for politicians, but, you know, I don't see how being corrupted really follows any of that. So, I, I just don't think that applies. That is, that's something to completely do with things. Different. Lewis says, but to do things that you don't like to, to make money, what, what is about this? That's a tricky thing. That is not so much necessary about the laws of abundance. You know, it depends on, you know, you're really talking about an individual unique thing. If you're saying, hey, I want to become very physically fit, and then you're saying, well, I really don't want to exercise, that's, you know, that's different than saying, hey, I don't want to beat up this kid to make money, you know? Or I don't want to steal from this person to make money. It's completely different. So it's more of, that's more of a, a wisdom that has to be applied in the context of the moment. You know, not everything you're going to be doing from here to there is going to be something you like or want to do. I didn't want to be sitting in my office on a Saturday day, spending six, eight, ten hours a day studying quantitative data, looking at patterns, analyzing data, analyzing patterns, charts, talking with my programmer. I didn't want to be doing that on a Saturday when it's sunny, beautiful outside, and there's like tons of people outside enjoying themselves at the pool. I wanted to be outside there as well. But I but I have something more important in mind. I have a goal. I have something that I want to get to. And I'm still building that. I'm successful, and 
guess what? I'm wanting to turn it up a notch. So, yeah, you're going to have to do things that you don't like to get from here to there. So, so hopefully that answers your question. Okay, okay, five minutes. Okay, so i got a few more questions in the ask it. Do, 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 do. Lewis says, so we're living in a very, very wrong world that the bad guys make money. I think that a lot of the people who are in power right now are manipulating that power and using their money in very manipulative ways so that they can get more money, but I don't think they're respecting the laws of abundance. I think that's why the world's in such a calamity right now. I think that's why I think that's why the world is so messed up. I think if people were I think if people were being a lot smarter with their money and really respecting abundance I don't think we'd be having the problems that we would. I think if all the people were in power were like Bill Gates with their money, I don't think we'd be having the situation that we're having. I don't think we'd be having, you know, very wealthy people influencing policy, influencing lobbying efforts to change laws so that they can have more money. I don't think it would be that way. So, yeah, I, I mean, to be honest, I think we're li living in a very... There's many times that, you know, things that are happening, the people there in power that they're doing make me very sad because I think they don't follow any of these principles of abundance. Maybe one, the willingness. They're willing to work hard for what they do, but they don't respect any of it else. And I think that's why there's so many problems that's happening in the world. So, PLIO says, could you please repeat the statement about the danger in life? Actually, this lesson's recorded, PLIO. You can, you can review it again and again, but I'll, I'll say it anyways. Michael Angelo said the danger in life is not setting a goal too high and not reaching it. He said the danger in life is setting a goal too low and reaching it. That's the danger in life. All right, last few things, and then I'm out of here. Uh, may I ask you your rating in chess? Just under 1,800. But it's been a while. I haven't, I haven't been spending much time playing lately because i got a lot of other things going on. So just around 1,800, nothing too special. Rob says, where are these brain gyms? They're on the Internet. Lumosity.com. That's one of them. So hopefully that answers your questions. What do you think about Wolf on Wall Street? I haven't read that one, Lewis, but a really good book that I did like was called uh, All the Devils Are Here. So hopefully that answers your questions. Barcinella, so Chris, what... Ken, what changed you when you had your bad streak or in your career? How was your attitude back then? Nah, nah. I think I've answered the question, Barcinell. So hopefully, hopefully I've answered that question. Um, said, does it work in? Right. Jano says, everything what you said does it work in third world countries, criminal countries? Absolutely. Your your mindset will have the greatest impact about what you're experiencing and what you go through absolutely can have an effect. I live in a country that can be often very corrupt. Argentina is way high on the corruption list. And there are many parts that are super criminal. And yet, I'm surrounded by people who actually respect the laws and energy of abundance. So, absolutely. You can change people. It just takes you changing yourself and then people seeing that in you. So, that's it. Barcinell says, how do you overcome that? Because it is so much more different to watch minus 500 compared to minus 5,000, even if your system is working. You're right. And I recommend it through controlled growth. Slow, continued success, following your risk management. If you're following your risk management, risking only 2% per trade, and you're slowly building up your account over time, then you will be building in a controlled growth fashion. And what happens is you'll be able to take it up to the next level. You'll slowly be able to increase your position sizing as your account grows. You keep doing that following the same percentage equity risk rules every single step along the way until you get to a level of money where when you are now making a trading decision, all of a sudden your mind, emotions, and everything come into play. And they start, make, they start causing you to make bad decisions. They start causing you to make emotional decisions, bad judgment. As soon as you get to that level 
and then you see your trading performance dip massively, you know you've hit your equity threshold. So go back to the previous level you were stable at and then start back over again. Get stable again with your trading and your success and consistency. And then from there, slowly increase it up again. Control growth. Eventually, you will get comfortable pushing up against that barrier, and eventually you'll break through it. But if you really want to get comfortable, follow all the laws of abundance, and you'll start to find yourself in more abundant situations, and you'll just naturally get more comfortable with it. So hopefully answers your question. Um, are all your trading decisions based solely on methods and principles? Is there a point where you had to make an intuitive decision? Doug, can you save that question to the next class? Because um, that's more about trading. It's not about the. It's not about you know the the topics that we're talking about in this class. So, hopefully, that answers your question. All right, great. I need to wrap it up. So, with that being said, I want to thank you all very much for coming. This has been resort, uh, has been recorded, and so I recommend definitely watching this video again and again and again. I also gave you links to two articles, Willingness, Responsibility, and Ownership in Trading, and then the other one was Your Equity Threshold. Read those articles. They have follow-up lessons to this, and so absolutely critical. Study them again and again and again. If I had to share my final thoughts, it would just be this is abundance and the, the nature of abundance has nothing to do with your physical or monetary resources that you have. It has to do with your relationship to what you have, to what you don't have, and your mentality around it. Abundance by nature refers to the plentifulness of energy. It could be resources, could be money, could be anything. But abundance most commonly observes the principles of cause and effect as a whole. And that by following these five principles, you realize that from hard work and the right mindset and practice these five principles, I would be willing to bet you will all find yourself in more abundant situations from the moment you start to the moment you continue to practice again and again. And I will be willing to bet in time you will see things change in a very real way. I can speak it from personal experience. I can speak it from people I know are very wealthy and very conscious about abundance. So with that being said, I want to thank you all very much for coming. It's fantastic here. Thanks for Epic Street and letting this go along. I bid you all adieu. Any questions about our services or our articles or anything like that, check us out, secondskiesforks.com, or email me directly, info at secondskies.com. Good luck trading. Thank you guys very much for being here. Thank you, FX Street, for hosting this. I will see you guys next week. Take care, everyone.